صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما altogether السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم جميعا يا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإذا صلخ الأشهر الحرم فاقتلوا المشركين حيث وجدتموهم وخذوهم واحصروهم واقعدوا لهم كل مرسد فإن تابوا وأقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة فخلوا سبيلهم إن الله غفور رحيم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد صل على محمد وآل محمد What happened in the aftermaths of the event of Karbala? What happened exactly after the martyrdom of Sayyidu Shuhada? Did the Imam of Ahlul Bayt, the master of the martyr, and all of his companions who fought loyalty alongside him ever receive ever receive any vengeance, compensation? Was there retribution held? Was justice served on the monsters who partook in this calamity and this ordeal that led ultimately to the greatest tragedy that befell the household of the Holy Prophet, arguably all of man and womankind? In fact, when you dig into history books from non-Muslim sources, they highlight it as amongst the biggest of calamities where injustice was served. If you read the likes such as sources that are written by non-Muslims, academics from various universities, they always emphasize that this was without a doubt, irrespective of adherence to religion or anything of that matter, an act of injustice to the highest caliber. A man who slaughtered a baby in his hands, his own baby, in front of him, all of his beloved ones, so on and so forth. Were those monsters ever held accountable? And if so, how did justice serve and play its role when it came to Umar ibn Sa'd, Shimur ibn Dhul Joshan, when it came to Harmula ibn Kahil, and when it came to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the mastermind behind this entire ordeal? How was it served and who exactly did serve that justice in their part? These are three key quintessential questions that we have to have the answers to in order to paint a clearer picture in our minds that forms what happened post Karbala. Because many people on the 10th of the uh, month of Muharram stop caring any longer. And that's evident in the amount of attendees that come for the program. For the first of Muharram, you may find a lot of people coming. For a day that highlights Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, the 8th of Muharram, as we have here in the Indo-Pak community, others in the Iraqi community hold a different day. Nonetheless, on that particular day, many people will come. Because those who have nidr, those who make a vow, that on the day of Abu Fadl, I'd like to serve food. So they'll only come that day. Every other day, perhaps not. Or perhaps a day in which, let's get this fixed, inshallah, after a lot of salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A second for the love of Umm al a third to hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time with your loudest of voices. Allah. 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 Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Let's go. Let's 
inshallah. The dua was answered, alhamdulillah. Oh, wait, actually, it wasn't. Bismillah. Let's keep both just in case Shaytan decides to ruin our majlis. In any case, the ultimate idea behind this discussion is to figure out three dilemmas. Was the Imam avenged? How was he avenged? What happened exactly after his martyrdom? And what was the journey post his martyrdom like? for the household of the Holy Prophet. Because if you were to ask the Imams themselves, they'll tell you that Karbala didn't stop and end on the 10th, it continued. Imam Zainul Abideen salam says what, when he's asked what was the most difficult part of this ordeal, he doesn't say Karbala, he doesn't say by the Ufurat, the Euphrates, when my uncle fell, or anything like that. He says Asham, 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 three times, Dimashq, Dimashq, Dimashq. And so you will find a great emphasis post the aftermaths. Let's examine these three areas in order that we are able to give back to the Ahlul Bayt with the knowledge that we acquire and to recognize what they actually went through and not be from amongst those who are ignorant to that fact and not fall into that category of I only prioritize the days that get more attention than any other day. The, the contrary, we should emphasize every single day the Ahlul Bayt had a smile or any day they had frowns. Inni silmun liman salamakum wa aduun liman adakum wa waliyun liman walakum wa harbun liman harabakum. If on a day like the 12th of Muharram they make their way to Kufa, they are frowning, they're not happy. The least I can do is see why my God's chosen emissaries are dissatisfied on that day. So let's examine this by first looking at post the martyrdom of Sayyidu Shuhada immediately what happened afterwards. As we know, like we recited earlier on the 10th, the Maqtal, we have the information and I will not review what happened on the Maqtal. That's a very difficult line that's only meant to be read once a year. The heart cannot take it twice. But just examining the areas that revolved around the Imam leading to his martyrdom, there were three individuals who partook in his slaughtering. We give it all to whom? Shimon ibn dhul Joshin. There were three who partook. A man by the name of Sinan bin Anas, la'anatullah alayh. Shimon ibn dhul Joshin, la'anatullah alayh. And an individual by the name of Khawla or Khuwayla. Khuwayla or Khuli actually. This, these three all contributed to what led to the ultimate slaughtering of the Imam. He was down, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. Two individuals ran, Shimon ibn Dhul Joshin and this Sinan bin Anas. Sinan tired the Imam so much before he was martyred at the amount of spears he lunged at him and the arrows he threw his way. Shimon ultimately committed the worst crime in humanity. This Khuli or Khuwalla, he grabbed the holy head of the Imam and raised it high. And he was in charge of taking care of that head, ultimately when they made it to Kufa. That's why the other night we recited the Musibah in which the head was taken care of. In the home of this Khuwalla, his wife had that dream. And we'll inshallah get into that. After that happened, the Imam of Ahlul Bayt laid on the ground, brothers and sisters, for three days. The 11th of Muharram, the family of the Imam made their way to Kufa. The 13th of Muharram, Imam was buried. Question, how can the Imam Zainul Abideen salam, be in Kufa and on the 13th also bury the Imam? There is a principle in Islamic theology, Islamic Shi'i theology, that only a Masoom can bury another Masoom. That is understood. And so if the Imam is still in Karbala, how is it such that Imam Zain al Abidin all the way in Kufa is able to come and bury him. Not just that, he's not just in Kufa relaxing in a home, he's in chains, he's in a prison cell. And some narrations state that the Imam was actually held in an animal pen. These women, the daughters of Rasulullah, held in animal pens for the night. No roof to shield them from the sun. The treatment that they went through. 
In any case, the question arises, how is he able to come back and bury the Imam? There's a wonderful research article done on this concept where somebody is someplace and in another place at the same time. For example, in the Holy Quran, we look at Asif bin Barkhiyah, the successor to Prophet Sulaiman. Read Surah An-Naml. It discusses Prophet Sulaiman's order in which he commands his people to bring me the throne of the Queen of Sheba. Bilqis had a throne and she lived on one side of the world and he lived on the other. One individual was a jinn. The Quran says, وَقَالَ عِفْرِيتٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ That a jinn raised his hand and he says, Prophet of Allah. Because as we know, Prophet Sulaiman had the ability to communicate to all the species. Jinn also. I will bring to you her throne before you get up. A man, the Quran doesn't use his name, just says an individual, raised his hand and said, hold on, I'll get you her throne before you blink your eye. And he got the throne immediately. What does the Quran attribute to his capability in bringing the throne? It says, كَانَ عِنْدُهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ He had some knowledge from the book. Some knowledge from the book. Now, Asaf bin Barqi is not a ma'asum. He's not an infallible. He's just in charge after Prophet Sulaiman with the affairs of the empire of, of that time. So he's not a ma'asum. Question, if a non-ma'asum is able to transport from one side of the globe to the other because he has some knowledge of the book, then what about the holy household in which the holy book was revealed to? These individuals, they, if they want, they have karamat. The prophets, they have their miracles. But the Ahlul Bayt, including some mu'mineen, will display a certain characteristic that is beyond understanding. Allah, if He wants, if He wills, He can decide to bless an individual on performing certain acts that are generally not possible to be performed. Only if you give Allah what He asks. You give Allah everything, Allah will give you everything. It's as easy as that. And we find the eighth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Al Rida Salawatullahi wa Salamu Ala. Arguing with the Waqifa sect that emerged during the time of Imam Al Qadam, who refused to acknowledge the Imamat of Imam Al Rida. They said, no, Al Imam Al Qadam was the last. We will perform Waqif, meaning stop, block. There is no more Imam. And you, Imam or you, Al Rida, are not an Imam Masum. They said, why? Because you are in Medina, your father died where? Imam al-Kadham is buried where? Qadamin, Baghdad. How is it that you're able to come and bury your father? You're not a ma'asum. He responds by saying this, then what about Imam Zain al-Abidin in Kufa and his father is in Karbala? How does he return? These questions are answered. If Allah wills, he'll do. Kun fayakun. And especially to the regular human being, Allah can give to them whatever they desire. Asif bin Barqiya is one example. But what about the ma'asumin who gave Allah everything and which Allah responds back to them, I want to give you until you are satisfied. Surah Al-Duha, the last few ayat, what does it say? وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى MashaAllah, it's only the younger ones that answer me. And your Lord will give you, who is this verse addressing? Do you know? The Holy Prophet. Your Lord will give you until you are satisfied. Question. We work to give Allah until He is satisfied. But when it comes to Rasulullah, Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm at your disposal. I will give you until you are satisfied. Then what about the one who Rasulullah says, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. Ahabballah man ahabba Husayna. And he mentions all the names of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. That same principle and lesson and blessing goes to them as well. And so if they want, Allah can easily give them whatever it is they desire. That happened, brothers and sisters, in this difficult journey. On the 11th of Muharram, the family of the Imam make their way to Kufa. This individual, Huli, he raises the heads deliberately in front of the family, such that they're behind these blessed heads and they have to watch them as they walk. And it brings great pain to them when they see their loved ones in the situation. They arrive in Kufa, the entire city is celebrating. 
the propaganda media and machine of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Yazid ibn Muawiyah was so good that people started calling them khawarij, that they are rebels, and they were pelting them with stones. There was a lady, the wife of Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, who was in this crowd, and they're walking in the middle of the street. Sayyidah Zainab, who just years before, no one would see her face because of how the Ahlul Bayt would cover her. She wouldn't leave the home except Abel Fadl al-Abbas and al Hussein and al Hassan were surrounding her such that her shadow wouldn't even be visible. That's how much they recognize her dignity. No one deserves to say, I saw her in this state. Now look at her in, her, in this state where she is walking and people are making names, pelting stones. The wife of Hur, Ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, She's placed in a difficult situation because news reached Kufa prior to the arrival of the family that her husband backstabbed the establishment. Because Hur, as we all know, he left the side of Umar ibn Sa'ad and joined whom? Imam al Hussein. And so she was already under a lot of ridicule. And so she had a soft spot for the Ahlul Bayt. If my husband joined you individuals, that's probably a, there's probably a good reason behind it. And of course, upon seeing the nur on their faces, her heart hurt and the way they were being treated. She wanted to offer them water. As they're being taken and this parade is being held, they're going where? To the court of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the mastermind behind this entire ordeal. As they're going, she comes and she says, I have water, does anybody want? At that moment, a young Sayyidah Sukaina wakes up. She was asleep. She woke up and she said, I heard somebody say water. Did my uncle Abbas return? She was still thinking and remembering the calamity. When she hears water, she only thinks of Al-Fadl Abbas, which is why we promise, inshallah, to take a vow. The next time you drink water, say, Ya Abbas. Say, Salamullah ala al Hussein. Send your salutations to the Imam whose lips were not quenched with water when he was slaughtered. We remember their names when we drink, inshallah ta'ala. And in that case, they make their way. But the thing is, they stay in Kufa for a number of days. In fact, they leave Kufa to go to Yazid's court on the 20th of Muharram. So they stayed for a good time. And when they stayed, the situations, as we mentioned, was very bad, very difficult. They stayed in where the animals would stay, these Hashemites, the children of Rasulullah, where sheep and of the likes would stay. And then one day, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad calls the Sayyidah Zainab to the court. And he brings her, and the, and the scenario is very difficult. As he brings her, he has the head of Mawla right next to him. And the holy head is right beside him, and he's poking it. And he tells the Sayyidah Zainab, how do you see what Allah has done to your brother? As he's poking the holy head of Aba Abdullah. She says, first of all, she says two things, powerful lines. If ever you want to see strength in the face of oppression, Sayyidah Zainab manifests it. Don't look any further. She says, first of all, mankind acts upon his own whim in which he is able to make good and make evil. So it wasn't Allah. Secondly, I saw nothing but beauty. Anybody at that moment would have dropped, would have fainted, would have died. She says, I saw nothing but beauty. Let's retract. What beauty? Karbala was beautiful to her. In which way? The principles my brother stood for, he never shook. How he stayed firm and forbearant, even in the face of difficulty. That was beautiful. And like the poet says, it's as if when she says, I saw nothing but beauty, perhaps she saw the future. Where is Yazid? Where is Hussein? We don't know where the grave of one is, but the grave of the other, no one can miss it. That was beautiful. She looks beyond and transcends time with that phrase. I saw nothing but beauty. Because what was beautiful about Karbala? The principles in which the Imam stood for and never shook. And the Mu'mineen, all of us, who even in the Western world will be holding majalis years after the calamities of Ashura, remembering and honoring those same exact principles that the Imam stood and ultimately was martyred for. And that was indeed beautiful. They make their way. And they want to make their way, because they're forced to, the court of Yazid. Of course, it's not a direct flight. The journey is difficult. So they stop in Mosul, Mosul, north of Iraq. They arrive there, and they're told by the propaganda machine, the inhabitants of that area, again, these are Khawarij, these are rebels, these are infidels. They cause the mess. 
and they, all they were used to doing to them was pelting them with stones, and there were individuals with spears that were poking at the wives of the Imam and the daughters of the Imam, just poking them like that. And the Imam asks Imam Zainul Abidin, is there anything I can do for you in this difficult situation? Imam says, go buy me a piece of cloth. Why? He says, just do the cloth, get it for me. And they get him the cloth, he puts it between the chain around his neck. He says, don't worry about me, this has been on my neck since Karbala. I just need to soothe that pain. They continue, they pass from the border of Iraq into Syria. They enter Halab, modern day Aleppo. The army of Yazid stop at a monastery. They get to this church and they want to spend the night. The Christian monk, they seek to request permission in order to stay that night, asks them, you can stay, no issue. Uh, what do you need? They say, we want to stay. He says, you can stay, no issue, not at all. But I have a question. That head right there, he's pointing at a particular head. Who is that? Why do you care? I'm just wondering. That's the leader of these rebels. He says, okay, can I have the head for the night? Just one night. They say, why? He says, please, just one night. You leave tomorrow, I'll just keep it for one night with me. He says, fine. He takes the holy head of Aba Abdullah to his home, Christian monk, and he fragrances it. He washes it. He begins to clean the cheek that was smeared with the blood of his son Abdullah al radi The cheek that was kissed by Rasulullah. And he begins to cry, not a Muslim. He begins to cry and then he begins to say, I ask you in the name of Jesus and his mother Mary, who are you? No response. He says, I ask you in the name of Muhammad and his family, who are you? Al-Allam al-Majlisi in his Bihar al-Anwar begins to say that the head started to speak. Saying, An ibn Muhammad in al-Mustafa, An ibn Ali in al-Murtada, An ibn Fatima al-Zahra, An al-Maqtul bi Karbala, An al-Adshan bi Karbala, An al-Mahroom bi Karbala, An al-Mazloom bi Karbala. O Christian monk, if you see the seven sleepers in the incident of the cave as a sign from Allah, then know I am the biggest sign of Allah. Ana Hussein ibn Ali, ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the Christian monk goes to the army and goes to the chiefs, asks them, can I keep the head? They said, no. Then he said, I will not leave this head then. Allow me to go with you on this journey. And he joins them. He joins them on this journey. They make their way from Halab and they continue and they enter through, the, through Lebanon, through Baalbek. In that area, one of the daughters of Imam al Hussein passes away. The journey was difficult and she is buried there. Of course, before the Imam, uh, the Imam's family crossed from Iraq to Syria in an area close to the border by the name of Sinjar, north of Iraq, one of the daughters of the Imam is also buried in that area as well. The Imam on the journey had many of his daughters die. It's a difficult journey, it truly was. And they make their way to the court of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. But as they're making their way, before they enter, it's the same scenario. People are pelting stones, people are yelling, people are celebrating. They were telling them, this is Eid for us, let's celebrate, dress in the best way. Make sure you do ghusl, cleanse yourself, color, beautify yourselves. We've captured a group of infidels. They enter the court of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Now mind you, the sermons that were given on that court are like no other sermons ever given in the history of the religion of Islam. Two, the sermon of Imam Zainul Abidin in the face of Yazid and the sermon of Sayyidah Zainab in the face of Yazid. However, both sermons require an entire lecture just to analyze and examine every single line. Because when you look at what the Imam says, he says some things never before said. An ibn Mecca wa Medina, an ibn Zamzam wa Safa, an ibn um, an ibn al-ladhi uh, sa'ad ala al-buraq lil-hawa and he begins to bring these wonderful interesting names I am the son of Mecca, Medina, Safa, Marwa a man who rode on the buraq and went to the skies so on and so forth he's introducing himself but then when a Sayyidah Zainab begins to speak she defames Yazid like no other way possible and the lines she used by beginning with praising Allah all praise is due to the Almighty Lord, Lord of the world. And then she begins to recall who she is to, her, to them. I don't care about you. Oh Yazid, speaking to you is of no satisfaction to me. 
but condemning you brings me great glory and satisfaction. At that point, you would be broken. You would be afraid. You're facing the individual who was in charge of this entire ordeal and calamity, but you still have the audacity to shun him, to insult him that way, which is why in this religion we recognize wholeheartedly that we don't just love people because of who they're associated with. I of course honor and recognize the nobility of these individuals because of who their parents were. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidah Zahra, your grandfather is Rasulullah, that's noble. But your respect is not given to, by, to you from us because of that. In this religion, you don't earn your respect from marriage, you earn it from merit. When I look at a stance like that, a lady like that, that's an incredible stance. No one would dare give. In fact, you would be afraid. And did you know that a Sayyidah السلام, three times she saved the school of Ahlul Bayt from being destroyed? The first time in Karbala, when Shimr came to the tent of, of uh, Imam Zain al Abidin and wanted to kill him, she stood in his way. Kill him, you have to kill me first. And he didn't do anything. The second time was where? In Kufa, where he wanted to lash out and she stood in his way. If you want to get to him, get to me. The third time was where? In Sham. Yazid was angry at this. And then he wanted to lash out. She stood in the way of Imam Zain al Abidin. You want to get to him? Get to me. Are you going to kill a woman? You shameful individual. They didn't do anything whatsoever. And so she, because of her, we have the rest of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And we owe her all of that and our entire theology for the stance that she stood for. And you find that after they give their sermons, which we mentioned require lectures just to do justice explaining and analyzing, Yazid was broken. There was nothing he could do except allow them what they wanted. And he said, what do you want? The first thing she said is, what you took from me, you can never give me back and return. But what we want is for you to honor the heads that you have and bring them back to where they deserve to go. He says, what do you mean? Allow us to return back to Karbala. Let us go back to Medina, but we have to stop in Karbala. And so they return and they allow them to have the heads because many ask that the Imams were buried and they were decapitated. The companions and the Imam, Abu Fadl al-Abbas, so on and so forth. How were they buried? Are they incomplete? No, when they returned, they brought back what was theirs. And so when they return back to Karbala, Imam Zain al-Abideen goes to his father. Rabab goes to her eight-month-old baby. And you find his, Qasim, his mother Ramla, goes to Al-Qasim where he was buried. Layla goes to Akbar. But no one can find the Sayyidah Zainab. Where did she go? Until they find her by the Euphrates. They find her near the body of Abel Fadl al-Abbas where he was buried. And they bring the holy head of the Imam and they bring it towards where he was buried. They got Ali al Akbar and he is buried by the feet. That is why, inshallah, when we are able to perform ziyara, recognize that where the feet of the Imam is, is also where Ali al Akbar is. So send your salams to Al Akbar when you are there, inshallah. And the Imam, as they put his head down in the grave, they hear a noise coming from that holy head and he is saying, Al Tifl, Al Tifl. The baby, the baby. He is requested for the baby to be buried on his chest and to be placed there. al radiyah was placed on the holy chest of the Imam alayhi salam. And the Ahlul Bayt made their way back to Medina al-Munawwara. And they began their Aza. The first to hold Majalis Aza, Majalis in commemorating the tribulations of the Imams were as Sayyidah Zainab and Umm al-Banin. That's where this tradition started from. They inaugurated this practice and sunnah, where every single Muharram, we recognize the calamities that occurred and we have to honor it. We are not Shia if we do not honor it. Many people bring that excuse, I am busy, I have this, I have that. Take that excuse with you to the Day of Judgment and see if the Ahlul Bayt will accept it. If not, then there's a lot of problems to address in that regard. In any case, how were they avenged? What happened? This was the 61st year after Hijrah. When did the Imams ever receive any compensation? Was there retribution? Who avenged them? You find that in the Maqtal, the Imam makes a beautiful dua where he raises his hands to the sky. If you're all paying attention, inshallah, he says, Allahumma sallat alayhim ghulama thaqif. 
O oh Allah, bring upon them the youth from Banu Thaqif, Al Mukhtar al Thaqafi. This individual, brothers and sisters, many people bring their research and they question some of his actions. Ultimately, he's not a masoom, and we all have mistakes in our lives and we all have black dots. But of course, if there's a black dot in your CV, no one's going to look at the rest of the achievements and accolades. They'll only focus on that black dot. No, doesn't matter. The individual, ultimately, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, ask Allah to send His mercy to him. When Imam Zainul Abidin says, Rahimallah al Mukhtar, Faqad Qama, Faqad Akhada Bitharina. May Allah send His mercy to Al Mukhtar al Thaqafi. For he avenged us, Ahlul Bayt. If the Ahlul Bayt send their salams and ask Allah to show mercy to an individual, that's sufficient for me to recognize that ultimately he's in good hands, inshallah ta'ala. And so this man, the 66th year after Hijrah, rose. He overthrew, there was a coup, and he overthrew the establishment in Kufa, who at the time was Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Now, this was the 66th year. When did Karbala happen? 61st year, so five years later. Interesting note here, observation. Al Mukhtar only ruled for a year and six months. But in one year and six months, books of history state he managed to capture 18,000 individuals who partook in the killing of Imam al Hussein in Karbala. The army of Yazid was 30,000 strong. Obviously, not every single one of them would have a direct impact and cause leading to the death of the Imam. But the others from those who rode the horses, those who sharpened weapons, those whose presence were there to make noise, all of that leads to the calamity and tragedy. And he captured 18,000 of them in a span of a year and six months. Him and whom? Him and Ibrahim, the son of Malik al-Ashtar. And one other man by the name of Abu Amra at tamar some individuals call him Kiyan or Kaysan. This was an individual, some state he was from Iran originally. He was born in Mada in Iraq, but some say his parents came from Iran. Ultimately, the, these three led to the revolution and the avenging of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. With what? What happened? They had their military. And so they sought out to first capture the main man behind all of this. They looked for Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad originally was hesitant in killing Imam al Hussein. He didn't want to. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was the man who sent him to go intercept Aba Abdullah before he reaches Kufa. And so he blocks him and he tells him two things. Either you receive allegiance from him, that he will pay, give allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah, or you kill him if he refuses. In both cases, I will reward you. He was offered the land of Ray, which is Greater Tahran in Iran. That verdant piece of land, lush, and he could obviously take that to his advantage and use it for himself, and he will live, and his generations will live, and they will not have to depend and rely on other people. So it was a very interesting and very good deal for him. But the thing is, what deal could you ever make when it comes to either life and death in regards to Imam al-Hussein? There's no deal, no matter all the wealth of the world. It's not worth, obviously. The Imam says, if you were to give me the seven heavens and every treasure on the earth to take the skin from a seed that an ant has, I would never do it. Then what about offering a sum to get the head of the Mawla? What kind of a man do you have to be? In any case, he was tempting and he said, look, I would rather not kill the Imam. And so he reaches Imam al Hussein and he says, Look, this is the deal. Please, do you want to change? Would you like to just say, I give allegiance, but not really mean it? So at least you're not killed and I get what I want? Imam said, No. He writes to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyan. Now, the outskirts of Karbala is pretty close to Kufa. And so they send the message. Ubaidullah reads it. He's reading it and he lied. He said, Hussein wants to give allegiance to Yazid. He just doesn't want to kill because you can't be that blind to kill the grandson of Rasulullah. And so he didn't want to do it. But when there's a big price after that, money makes the world go around. And so he lied and he didn't want to do it. Who was sitting right next to him? Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Who was sitting right next to him and convinced him otherwise? Shimr ibn al Joshin. Shimr, this mal'oon, sitting and he says, Do you really believe that Imam Hussein would say something like that? That he'll just give allegiance to Yazid? 
Wallah, he never will give allegiance to Yazid. He's not from that character. I know his father, Ali. Because Shimon was a Kharaji who fought against Amir al-Mu'mineen. I know his father, Ali. It was so easy for him to say, Muawiyah, okay, we'll be good. We will not fight. We'll settle. I'll give you allegiance. You give me... Nothing happened from him. You think it's going to happen with Imam Hussein? This is a lie. So, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad accepts what Shimr told him. And he writes back. He says, O Umar ibn Sa'ad, either you bring me his head or I take your head. And in the process, I'll send Shimr to go and do the deal and I'll reward him with Ray. One of the ulama used to say whenever we used to pass by the city in Iran, Ar Ray, he said his mother would be with him. And so when we ever, whenever we got near it, if we had to go somewhere, we need to pass this area, his mother would say, do not drive us near Rai. Why? It's like over this piece of land, Imam Hussein was killed. I don't want to go here. And this just expresses the love many people have. The land is not accountable for anything. But the point was, whatever reminds me of what led to the death of the Imam, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't even want to drive through it. In any case, Umar ibn Sa'ad said, no, 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 I don't want Shimur ibn Dhul Joshin to lead this campaign. Don't. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, deal with, I'll make this happen. Ubaidullah still sends Shimur. He sends him, they arrive. Shimur says, you heard his orders. You know what to do. You either kill him or I take this and I kill him and then your head is on a platter. They said, okay, hold on, listen. We'll make a deal. I will just lead the army. You be the spear and spearhead this army. So you do most of the killing. I'll just... Be like a de facto ruler. They agreed. Shimur, by the way, was such a cowardly individual. If you're going to be that evil, at least display some bravery. He never once partook in the war. You know what he would do? Whenever they bring him someone wounded, he would kill them. That's how we say Jaban he was. What a coward he was. One of the soldiers of Imam al-Hussein by the name of Nafiq bin Hilal al-Jamali was an archer. He said he would write his name on each arrow such that anyone who he would attack, they would know who attacked him. They captured him and they brought him to Shimon and he killed him. So that's all he would do. And ultimately he murdered Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. He never partook in anything. And so he was a coward. Mukhtar al-Thaqafi searched for Umar ibn Sa'ad. They looked all over the place and they eventually found him hiding in Kufa. They found him hiding in Kufa but his advisors told him, don't kill him. He says, why? If there's anyone who deserves punishment, it's him. He said, don't. He had the army under his control. He probably still has individuals loyal to him. And we don't want an uprising to occur over his death. Give it some time, imprison him, and then do what you need to do later on. He says, fine. He put him under house arrest, and many people would watch over him. And he made two conditions. You don't leave your home, and you don't partake in activism. So you don't come outside and join a revolt, or speak up, or attend a sermon, nothing. You stay in your home, and that's it. You don't write, nothing. He agreed. Umar ibn Sa'ad had a servant in his home. He told his servant, my servant, go and put the saddle on my horse. He's like, okay. He puts the saddle on his horse. What now? He's like, I'm going to leave Kufa. So, but you're not supposed to leave, they'll kill you. He said, look, no one will know. I, I can't live here anymore. I'm afraid they'll kill me anyways. This man gets on his horse and leaves. People were watching. Al-Mukhtar had people watching over him. Intelligent services. They knew he left. They immediately reported to Mukhtar. Mukhtar, he just left. Should we kill him? He says, no. Why? What if we'll never catch him? And we'll never avenge Imam al Hussein by getting rid of the man who led to the death of the master of the martyrs. He said, look, in his neck is a leash that'll lead him back to us. What do you mean a leash? The dua of Imam al Hussein. When the Imam said, oh Allah, impose on every single individual who partook in my calamity, the young man from Thaqif, that means his dua is always answered. And so he'll return back to us. Whether he likes it or not, he'll come back. Just let him go. He goes. He's about to leave the outskirts of Kufa. His servant keeps begging him, let's go back. Let's go back. Until he tells him, listen, if you leave, they'll eventually catch you. Because they'll just follow you tra your trail. But if you stay and live your life here, there's probably a chance that you will not die. So let's go back quietly. Make sure no one sees us. He was convinced. He went back. As he was on his way back, they got him. Come here. 
how could you leave? You broke the deal when you said you wouldn't leave. And now we have you. What do you think we're going to do with you? They brought him to Mukhtar. And Mukhtar looks at him and he says, did you leave? He says, I did leave. He says, look, I'm not going to punish you because you left. I'm going to punish you because of the huge amount of history that you have against the Ahlul Bayt. But now I have a reason to punish you. And so he removes him. He removes his head, he decap decapitates him. He had a son who was also present in Karbala. And his son would also come every single day to the court to report his status. Because if you're held under home imprisonment, in that case, you have to come and report yourself that you're still here. When his son came to the, uh, the court of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, just to report that he was present, he told him, where's your father? How come he didn't come with you? He says, my dad is still in his home. He lied, obviously. He knows he's not in his home. But he doesn't know that they realized what, just, what, what they did. He says, no, he's still in, in the house. He says, really? Mukhtar says, bring the head of Umar ibn Sa'ad. They bring it. Whose head is this? He says, that's my dad. And how can I live my life after the death of my dad? What kind of dad was that? And then they get rid of him as well because he also partook in Karbala. Who was next? The horsemen. There were 10 horsemen that trampled over the blessed body of Abu Abdullah. 10. And they had the strongest of horses. They captured each and every single one of them. But do you know who captured them? This individual, Abu Amra at tamar rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. He found each and every individual, 10 of them. He captured them. The same thing you did to Abu Abdullah will do to you. They chained them to the floor and they got horsemen to trample over them. Alhamdulillah. And they got through with them. Who's next? Shimr ibn Dhul Joshim. Shimr had escaped Kufa. He knew after he saw what happened to Umar, Sa'ad, and all of these in riffraff, he went to Basra. Basra was governed by a man by the name of Mus'ab ibn Zubair. Mus'ab ibn Zubair was a rival against Mukhtar al thaqafi They didn't like each other. And so if I go to the enemy of my enemy, that person is my friend. And so I'm protected when I'm in Basra. He goes to hide in Basra. Mukhtar sends Abu Amr al-Tammar, this individual, with 500 horsemen and they go down to Basra to find him. They found him in a city, and some narrations say in the woods, hiding. And it was a hot day, so in tradition state, he wasn't clothed, he was unclothed, he was sleeping like the animal of which he was. And they got to him, they woke him up, and they said, come with us. He began fighting, he started fighting back. Abu Amr al-Tammar lunged at him with his spear to his side. And then they brought him back to Al-Mukhtar. They brought him to Mukhtar al-Thaqafi and he looked at him and he says, Are you Shimr? He says, Yes, I am Shimr ibn al Joshin. Shimr cowered out. He began to scream and cry and he never stood for what he did. He just began to cry and wail. What, he, what uh, Mukhtar al-Thaqafi did next really should put a smile on the lovers of Imam al-Hussein. He severed his hands, severed his feet, burned his body, and whatever was remaining, he gave it to the dogs and they ate him. Shimon ibn Dhul Joshin, before the tenth of Muharram, ran to one of the tents of Imam al Hussein, the tent of the Imam himself actually, and he lit it on fire. He burnt it. Imam came out and he says, Are you burning my home? May Allah burn you in the dunya before the akhirah. And that was fulfilled. His body was burnt in the dunya. And then it was burnt in hellfire. al Masir. And they captured Shimon, and that's how he was dealt with. Sinan bin Anas was next. They say it's either Sinan or Shimon ibn Dhul Joshin who decapitated Imam al Hussein. If it wasn't Sinan who decapitated him, then Sinan, before the Imam was killed, was the one who made the Imam go unconscious. From the amount of times he slashed at him, they say he threw that rock on the forehead of the Imam. And he lunged a spear at him multiple times in his blessed chest. They found him hiding and he went to Basra as well. Mus'ab ibn Umar was a safe haven for all of these individuals. They captured him. They brought him to Al-Mukhtar. Sinan ibn Anas, however, was a wretched man. He didn't cower out. He began to show honor. Yes, I killed him. What are you going to do? I did it. Who cares? And I'll do it again. This wretched individual, 
Imam Hussein, whatever he did to Imam Hussein, Al Mukhtar did back to him. So he lunged at him from the side, from on his chest. He began to slash at him the same way he did to the Imam, as he reported to Al Mukhtar what his role was. And ultimately, they fed him to the dogs again. A last individual remains was this man by the name of Harmala bin Kahil. Al Mukhtar, some narrations say, gathered the heads of these wretched monsters and actually sent them with a man to go to Medina to present them to Imam Zainul Abidin to show him, look, we, we did this. Are, are you happy? The Imam sees the head and he begins to praise Al Mukhtar and he begins to honor him. But then the narration say he asked about one individual. He says, what about Harmala bin Kahil? If there's anybody you're going to ask about, why Harmala? It means the event that took place, which Harmala was involved in, really broke the Imam's heart. What about him? Was he caught? Was he ever captured? This man said, no, he wasn't captured. We couldn't find him. He says, that's a shame. Inshallah, you find him soon. When the Imam says, Inshallah, that's a dua, mustajab, done. He returns back, this messenger, back to Kufa. When he enters Kufa, he cannot find Mukhtar. Where is he? He asks around, they say he's looking for Harmala bin Kahil. Al Mukhtar himself would not go out and search for these individuals. He has to be at the helm of this and control everything. But for this wretched individual, he looked for him himself. And they found him in Mosul, hiding. He was trying to cross the border. They brought him. They brought him back to Kufa. When Al Mukhtar saw him, he began to ask him a few questions. He says, Are you? who we think you are? He, says, he gave up, yes, I am Harmala. He says, Harmala, why would you do what you did? He says, no, you don't know what I did. I was like, what did you do? And he begins to retell the story. He says, Hussein had a six month old and he brought him to the field. When he brought him, he laid him down on the floor, hoping someone will come and quench his thirst. No one came. And he says, Shimur, wherever he is, he tells him, we, we got to him. You're next, by the way, but what about him? He's like, he told me. Take that arrow that you used to slaughter big game and aim it at that baby. He's like, then what did you do? He's like, I aimed it and I killed the baby. He says, but it wasn't the killing of the baby necessarily that broke my heart. What was it? He says, when the arrow hit him, because of the heat, the baby began to flap his arms like a bird begins to flap his wings. And not just that. There's an interesting line he narrates. He says he immediately hugged the imam after that, the baby. And I saw a smile on his face, subhanAllah. Why was the baby smiling? The poet comes and says, Oh Abdullah, you were smiling because you saw a Zahra saying, My baby, come to me now. Come back to me. Let me give you water when no one decided to give you water. But the tribulation doesn't end there. When the family, ultimately brothers and sisters, Al-Mukhtar captured every single one of them. Walhamdulillah. And dealt a fatal blow to all of them. Retribution was served. But when the family made their way to Sham, they were held in a prison cell all together. A Sayyid al was screaming, I want my father, I miss him, I want him now. I just saw him in my dream and he's telling me, we will see you soon. I want him now. Due to her yelling, Yazid woke up. He says, what's that noise? They say it's the daughter of Hussein. What does she want? She wants her father. He says, okay, take her father to her. And they bring the head of the Imam covered. And she says to her aunt Zainab, my auntie, I never asked for food. I don't want anything. I'm not hungry. I just want my dad. And she opens and she sees the head of her father. And she begins to hug the head saying, oh my father, who broke you? Who slaughtered you? And who severed your head from your body? Oh, my father, where were you when we were taken from Kufa to Sham? And she begins to plead and plead, and then she dies. When she dies, the lady who took her to wash her up in the ghusl asks the Sayyidah Zainab, she says, Sayyidati, was the Sayyidah Ruqayya ever sick? Was she sick? Sayyidah Zainab says, no, she wasn't sick these last few days. Why? She says, then what are these blue marks on her body? What are these marks on her back? What were they? She says, those are the whips of Shimur ibn dhul Joshin on the daughter of Hussein. When they entered that cell, Yazid had a wife by the name of Hind. She asked, who are these people coming? 
Her servants told her that these are rebels that we captured. She says, from where? They respond, from Medina. She says, how I love Medina. I used to work in a house in Medina as a servant, and the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib it was. How I love that city. I want to speak with these people from Medina, just to see how it was. And she goes to the cell, and she sees all of these women on the floor, sitting, chains, disheveled and frail, withered. And she goes to what seems to be, in her eyes, the leader of this group, Zainab al-Kubra. And she goes up to her and she says to her, My dear lady, I see that you guys are from Medina. How I love Medina. I want to ask you about a home. They say this lady, this queen, Hind, the wife of Yazid, out of respect for Medina, she sat on the floor. She says, because you guys walk on Medina, and I want to sit on that same floor as you. And she sat on the floor, and she begins to ask her, I have a house I want to ask you about. Sayyidah Zainab asks, which house? She says, the house of Ali and his family. She begins to tell her, what is it you want to know about that house? She says, I would like to ask you about a few members in that home. Who would you like to ask about? She begins to say, I want to ask you about Abbas. Where is Abu Fadl al-Abbas? He was a little boy in that home. I remember as he used to run and play. Where is Abu Fadl al-Abbas? Sayyida Zainab points and she says, Do you see that head? That is Abu Fadl al-Abbas held high on the spear. She begins to ask, then where is Hussein? She begins to tell her, Hussein is the head right next to him. And then she asks her, oh my lady, this is the house I saw and served. I want to ask you about one more individual. Where is Zainab al Hashemiya? Sayyidah Zainab replies, I don't know where that person is. If you are asking me about Zainab al Hashimiya, then I don't know where Zainab went. But if you ask me about Zainab al Misbiya, Zainab the captive, then here she is right in front of you. This hint stood up and ran back to Yazid. As she was running to him, her hijab began to fall. Yazid saw her and he began to say, Watch out, your hijab is falling. There are people. She said, How dare how dare you? <laughs> How dare you? You worry about my hijab. What about the hijab of the daughters of Rasulullah? The hijab of the daughters of Ali ibn Abi Talib. What about the hijab of the daughters of Fatima to Zahra? You ask me about my hijab. What about the hijab of Zainab? The hijab of Sukaina? The hijab of Ruqayya? Oh Allah, we ask you on the 12th of Muharram. Brothers and sisters, there's one more day. Make it an effort to come on that day. It's the last day of this event. But the trials don't stop on the 13th. They continue. Make it an effort and make it a vow in your heart to attend the center on every occasion that remembers Ahlul Bayt. Whenever there's a mention of the Imams, of the Holy Household, make it an effort. It's the least we can do for that man who lay on Karbala with, any, with no one to come to him. And we perhaps don't have the pleasure to be in Karbala. The best thing we can do right now, the alternative is here. Make it an effort these last few days to come by and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in that regard. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara of Imam al Hussein. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the shafa'a of Imam al Hussein. And we ask Allah on Imam Zain al Abidin to cure all of our sick ones, to grant us all of our hajat. علماء الشهداء سيما من أوصانا بالدعاء رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة تسبغ الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد مأتم الحسين يا حسين